thanks everyone for uh, coming over to listen to our presentation today. Uh, and thank you Black Hat for having us. Uh, this is indeed our great pleasure to be here with you. So, uh, if you are here, I already assume that you have been, uh, you already know what, what VMR Workstation and Fusion is. So, we have been exploring vulnerabilities in VMR and VMR patches for a while now. And the presentation title, The Great Escapes of VMR, kind of summarizes our findings and what all guest to host escape attacks we have seen in the recent past. So we have pretty much a lot of content to share with you today and with some demos. So what we'll try to do, we'll try to push the demos to the end of our presentation so that we are, we are good with the timings. So this is about me. My name is Devashish. I'm currently working in McAfee Labs IPS vulnerability system. As a part of the team, my primary job is to uh, kind of uh, uh, find new attacks and provide mitigation for them. And this is my colleague, Yakun, can you please? Hello everyone, uh, I'm also, uh, my name is Yakun Zhang and uh, I'm also a security researcher from McAfee IPS vulnerability research team. I was a malware analyst uh, in the past few years. Now I'm focusing on software and Linux kernel security. You can find me on Twitter, thank you. Thanks Yakun. So this is the agenda of our talk today. We'll, uh, we'll quickly start with uh, why we started this research, what was the motivation behind do doing this uh, VMR patch analysis that we have been doing for past uh, one year. So after that, we are going to quickly jump into the pop most popular attack surfaces that we have seen that has been targeted by vulnerability researchers to perform guest to host escapes. Uh, after that, in today's talk, we are going to basically three attack surfaces. The first one is the RPC. The second one is the virtual printer attack surface. And after that, we are going to move to the graphics components of VMR. And after that, we'll be finishing our talk with a the vulnerability trend analysis of VMR that we have seen and that we may see in the near future. So VM escape is something that scares all of us. If you're someone who is dealing with untrusted code on a daily basis, there cannot be anything more scarier than VM escape. So as you all know that VM, uh, VMR is uh, kind of a sophisticated piece of software. And when it comes to understanding uh, the internals and security implementation of any huge software, uh, beginning is probably always the hardest because you don't have any port of entry. You don't know where to get started from. So we have seen that VMR has been targeted in many exploitation contests in the recent past. And, uh, and what we have seen in after the contest that most of the details were not uh, even available to public. So, the, the, the successful exploits were demonstrated, but the details were not public. So the, our VMR story kind of started in November 2016, when, uh, in the, in, when VMR exploitation was exploited twice, I guess, if I'm not wrong, in the Pornfest uh, exploitation contest, and two successful exploits were demonstrated. So VMR sec security actually acted really fast, and they have released patches for those vulnerabilities. Uh, so we actually uh, thought probably we can, uh, it, it was right time to do some perform bar binary diffing and patch diffing to the patches. Because if you do binary diffing or patch diffing, so it, it, it doesn't only give you a port of entry to a huge software, but it also takes you to the software components that matters the most. And the best thing about post exploitation contest patches are, they will be mostly having security fixes. They are free from any functional or de design changes. So we thought probably that was the right time to get started with it. So when we, at the very early stage of our, of our research, what we started doing, we, we wanted to uh, find out the most popular uh, components of VMR that has been targeted. So we started analyzing the advisory that VMR uh, publishes, and, and this is what we have come up with. The advisories are mostly not very technical, but, uh, but it will have some component details, which uh, it was affecting which component. So we have seen some vulnerabilities in SVGA component, which is the graphics of uh, VMR workstation. And we did see some issues getting fixed in RPC layer. And we have seen some issues getting fixed in virtual printer as well. We did see some other issues, but uh, the numbers were not too much. So the, in this presentation, we are going to discuss the major one. So we have seen that VMR workstation and Fusion shares most of the core functionalities. So whenever any patch was applied to workstation, it was getting applied to Fusion as well. But some of the vulnerability that we are going to demonstrate today uh, were mostly uh, will showcase in workstation, but they will be they were they were affecting fusion as well. So these are as I have already said, these are the three attack surfaces we are going to cover in today's presentation. So we are going to start with the RPC. 
So, so, so the guest operating system and the host operating system has to communicate with each other for a lot of reasons. So if I have to, uh, if I have to define the VMR RPC in single sentence, it will be like, it can be considered as a communication channel that is used by guest operating system and host operating system to communicate with each other. So if you're familiar with VM tools, uh, VMware, you must be familiar with a uh, tool called VM tools that you usually install inside the guest operating system. So this is a tiny piece of software that you install inside the guest operating system and it makes your life a lot easier by, uh, by bringing a lot of features like uh, file folder sharing between guest and host, uh, uh, the clipboard sharing, uh, drag and drop, copy paste, and uh, uh, clock synchronization, and there are many features. So most of these features actually need smooth communication between guest and host. So VM tools actually makes use of RPC channel to enable many of these VM tool features in the guest operating system. So once you install VM tools, what you see in a, a new process get started every time the guest boots up. The process name is VM tools d.exe. So this process is actually responsible for interacting with the RPC channel and do some stuff that VM tool brings. So when talking about guest RPC mechanism, any application inside the guest operating system willing to communicate with the RPC channel has a couple of options to do that, to communicate. The first option they have is it can directly interact with the VM backdoor. So VM backdoor is a special IO port specific to VMware. We are going to come back to this later on. So the next option it has, it can use the existing APIs that VM tools provide to the application. So VM tools actually comes with a DLL that is known as VM tools.dll. It exports many APIs that you can see here. These are all mostly RPC related APIs. So they, any application can use this DLL and the exported APIs to communicate with the RPC channel. So now let's talk about the VM backdoor. So VM backdoor can be considered as the lowest component of RPC implementation in VMware. And this is nothing but a special IO port. The set of assembly instruction that you see here uh, and th that has to be executed to be able to interact with the VM backdoor. The, here the EAX register is holding the VMR magic bytes and e EVX will, uh, will hold the command number. Uh, for guest to host RPC, the command has to be set to hex 1E. And the EVX will hold the, uh, hold the parameter uh, required for the, you know, the, for the command. And EDX will hold the VMR IO port. There are basically two VMR IO ports, 5658 for the low bandwidth and 5659 is for the high bandwidth communication. And after that, we see a in, is privilege instruction that is called in. So this instruction, when executed inside the guest operating system, the hypervisor kind of hijacks the control flow and process the request accordingly. So this VM backdoor actually supports uh, two protocols. One is RPCI and TCLO. Uh, the, the interesting part about the backdoor is you cannot disable it fully. So it doesn't matter if you have VM tools inside in the, your guest operating system or not, you cannot disable it fully. So we have talked about some of these features that VM tool bring inside the guest operating system. So to be able to communicate with the host, the guest operating system has to send some command from guest to host. So the guest operating system usually does this by sending RPC, uh, RPC packet from guest to host. As you can see here, uh, this is a raw RPC packet we have taken from VM tools d.exe process. So it, the, the, each and every v RPC packet of VMware actually starts with a command RPC command stream. So when the packet is actually received at the host end, the based on this uh, based on this command, the host actually decides how to process the packet. So as you can see here, we are actually sending uh, the process is actually sending VMX tools get version command to the host from guest. So now let's talk about RPC packet handling. So we have come so far that the guest uh, operating system has sent the RPC packet to the host operating system. Now what happens in the host operating system? So if you have a Windows host, for each running virtual machine, you see in a process will be there, and the process name is vmrvmx.exe. This process actually holds the most of the virtualization code, the hypervisor code. And uh, since this is pretty complex, it is very attack prone. And this, this binary will actually handle all these RPC commands that is received from the guest, op the guest operating system. So since this handles a lot of untrusted data that is coming from the guest operating system, this is considered as the most popular gateway to escape from VMR virtual machines. So to be able to hit those uh, RPC command handler, we, 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 we somehow we should be able to send custom RPC packets from guest to host. As I have already said, there are multiple options to do that, but 
And what we have seen that the easiest option probably would be to uh, use the existing APIs to send those RPC command. As you can see here, we are using Python C type library to, and we are using vmtools.dll to use the existing API to send RPC command. So we are basically using RPC start, RPC send, RPC stop function from vmtools.dll to send RPC packets. So now we are going to take a quick look at some of the vulnerabilities that has been fixed in RPC layer of VMR. So when we started patch analysis, what we have seen that uh, after the pwn fest was over and we started doing binary diffing, this is what we have come up with. As you can see, the left side, this is a vulnerable code, and VMR has added a fix for this vulnerability by adding a small check. So what is interesting about the vulnerability? What you see here, uh, that there is a memcpy, memcopy call here, which is highlighted in the red. And the arguments of the memcp, memcopy call was actually coming from the second argument that was passed to that function. So when you did some reverse engineering, what we have found that that second argument was actually directly coming from the guest operating system, and which is definitely untrusted data. And the data that we are getting as a second argument of the function, it is nothing but a DNDCP RPC packet. And this entire things are untrusted data and coming from host operating system. What you have seen that some of these highlighted uh, structure members, if we can play with that, we can do some interesting stuff using this vulnerability. So after doing some analysis, what you have seen that we can uh, achieve out of bound read using that bug. So to be able to achieve an out of bound read condition, what you have to do, you have to send an RPC packet with following characteristics. First, we set the packet payload size to maybe for 500 bytes, and we do not put any payload into it. So when the memcp uh, when the memcp uh, memcopy call will execute, since we have set the payload size to 500, but there is no payload in it, we'll actually overread some data from the next adjacent heap block, and we'll have an out of bound read. So the so the interesting part about the, this vulnerability was using the same bug, we can achieve out of bound overwrite as well. So to be able to achieve out of bound overwrite, you have to send more than one packet from guest to host with the following characteristics. Point to be noted here, the session ID of the packet should be the same one. Let's see. So once the first packet is received at the host end, the VMR VMX process will actually uh, allocate a memory uh, in a heap of 1000 bytes, uh, 10,000 bytes, since the binary size is set to 10,000. And since the payload size is set to 500, it will copy 500 bytes of data into the allocated buffer. Now once the second packet is received at the, VM, uh, at the host end, the, since the session ID is same, VMR VMX will actually use the same allocated buffer to copy the new payload. Since the new payload size is FC00, and we have, if we sum up, we see that we, we have a 100 byte overwrite, heap overwrite, it will actually overwrite uh, the first few bytes of next adjacent heap block. So this is actually how we can achieve out of bound write using the bug. So we have talked about this out of bound write. Now how we can do some interesting stuff using that out of bound write. So ASLR is a is something that you uh, has to be bypassed to be able to perform exploitation in modern uh, operating system. So now we are going to take a look how can we bypass ASLR using that out of bound write. So to be able to steal info from VMR VMX process, what do we need? We need to prepare a certain memory layout. So this is what you see. This is the this is this should be the memory layout we need to prepare from in the guest in the host operating system to be able to, uh, uh, to leak some interesting information. So we see a, we uh, we we set up an the red. Uh, block that you see it's the overflow chunk on which we are going to uh, trigger the overflow and this is the yellow one is the control string which you control from the guest operating system so the the interesting thing about, thing about control string is you have uh, from the guest operating system you have access to the read and write to that block and after that we have a dndcp object so once we trigger the overflow, we are going to overwrite some of the initial bytes of the, uh, in the next adjacent heap block, which is the control string. And, and we do this, and we actually modify the, the length of the string, the control string. And when the string is, uh, the length of the string is modified, uh, and if we try to read back the string from the guest operating system, what we have, we'll have the address of VF table address of DNDCP object in the guest operating system. 
So once we have the VFTable address of VMR VMX, we can easily uh, craft our uh, base, find the base address of VMR VMX and craft our rope gadget and perform exploitation. So this actually, this was actually, uh, uh, it was shown by uh, Chan Security Research Lab. Uh, they have published a blog post uh, a few months back, I guess. So we have seen yet another bug that was uh, uncovered in uh, the NDCP. The interesting thing about the bug is, this bug is completely identical to the bug we have just dis discussed. But the only issue is this bug was residing in the DNDCP version 3. So to be able to trigger the vulnerable code, to reach the vulnerable code the, from the guest operating system, what attacker has to do, has to, attacker has to downgrade the DNDCP version to 3 from 4. So to be able to do that, you need to simply send following set of RPC command from guest to host. Once the version is downgraded in the host, you can simply uh, uh, you can simply perform the exploitation in the same way we have just discussed. So we have seen a uh, use after free also uh, issue also got passed in VMR in recent days. So this use after free POC is quite simple. What you have to do, you have to send a certain sequence of RPC command. So first we need to set the DND version to 2 by sending these commands. And after the DND version is set to 2, we need to change the version to re-register the DNDCP version to 3. So once the once the we, we set we registered the DNDCP version to 3, the host will actually register version 3 RPC and free some function pointers registered for different version 2 RPCs. The structure actually we have found by reverse engineering that you can see here. So Although the function pointers are free, the sum of the associated callbacks that you see here are remain active. That was the problem actually in this issue. So after that, when this scenario, this, this is the situation in the host process, after that if you send any of this RPC call from guest operating system to host operating system, we can actually trigger and use after free. So there is an uh, interesting blog that was published recently. We, we have added the blog into the reference section you, uh, regarding the exploitation of this uh, bug. So now the question is how these issues uh, could be identified and now in future how can we find similar issues in the VMR workstation. So what we, have, what we can conclude here, we have seen to be able to audit these RPC command handlers, we need basically four things. So we need some valid RPC commands, we need some valid RPC packet structure and any way to send RPC command from guest to host and some monitoring engine in the host to monitor uh, some of the interesting event that occurred inside the host process. So this, uh, the valid RPC commands can be easily collected from the open source component of VM tools and also you can reverse engineer the VMR VMX process to find out this command and RPC structures are very well defined in the open source component of VM tools. So and we have already seen how can we send custom R custom RPC packet from guest to host operating system. So we just need to uh, we just need to uh, implement a monitoring engine in the host so that we can perf we can uh, we can uh, we can craft a fuzzer for this RPC command handlers. So we actually have no idea how these bugs were identified, but we we we, we think that probably it it can be a result of some semi dumb fuzzing, and if if and similar issues can be identified if we craft a fuzzer in this way. So now I'd like to request Yakun to you know, explain the virtual printer part. Okay. <clears throat> the second the tech surface uh, we would like to show you is the is the VMware virtual printer. VMware virtual printer is a feature that allows guest virtual machine to print documents by using the available printers in uh, on the host. Considering some security reasons, it is not a de default feature on the VMware workstation. Users should enable this uh, this feature uh, in the VMware Preferences menu before boots the virtual machine. Guest virtual machine uses COM1 port to talk to the virtual print proxy uh, uh, on the host. When user boots a guest virtual machine with virtual printer feature enabled, vprint proxy.exe will be launched by on the host by VMware VMX.exe. <coughs> VMware VMX.exe and VPrintProxy.exe are communicated with each other through named pipes. So when user in the guest virtual machine writes data, uh, writes data <coughs> uh, to COM1 port, 
uh, the data will eventually as an input in vprintproxy.exe. So <clears throat> in this procedure, uh, some operations of uh, some operations of EMF spoon file will be processed from the guest to the host. EMF spoon is a meta file format that stores a print job. Uh, it contains the device settings and the print content, <coughs> uh, which is represented by EMF file. We will not go over the details of EMF spoon file in in this talk. Uh, when we print proxy.exe receive the print job, it will load tpview.dll to, uh, to do a print preview work. tpview.dll will pass the EMF content and render the preview on the screen. Because of this interesting function of tpview.dll, one can craft a malformed EMF spoon and the EMF file, a write to COM1 port in the guest virtual machine, trigger bugs in vprintproxy.exe, and finally get the code execution on the host. The architecture is like this. Uh, guest virtual machine writes data to COM1 to vmware.vmx.exe on the host. Uh, then vmware.vmx.exe will communicate with vprintproxy.exe by named pipes. vprintproxy.exe get the content and load tpview.dl to do the print print preview job. After we learn the architecture, we would like to know how to trigger this print preview job by, by programming. First, uh, we would like to thanks to Google security researcher, Costia. He did a great job on fuzzing tpview.dll vulnerabilities many years ago. Our triggering code is based on his one POC code. In this POC code, the variable div mode contains many preview settings such as the preview page width and height. Um, variables EMF spoon header and EMRI meta file ext are commonly no need to change. Uh, <clears throat> what we should do is preparing a crafted EMF file as the argument of this trigger function. Then it will be fine to do the print job for us. Obviously, this code structure can be easily changed to make a faster as well. Now let me simply explain what is EMF file. EMF is an abbreviation of enhanced meta file format. It's a, meta f <coughs> it's a file format that can store in de in device independent representations of graphics images. It is very wi widely used by many softwares, such as the Internet Explorer, Microsoft Office and some print drivers, including Vim, you know, VimWare Virtual Printer. Besides the general file header, it is mainly composed of many, uh, many records named EMR structures. <coughs> and except the default record types, if you wish to print something like a JPEG file, your JPEG file will be embedded in an EMF file as a customer record. As we mentioned, EMR is the EMF uh, record structure. It contains the properties and the definitions for representing the EMF file. EMR has a lot of default types. These types are grouped into many categories, such as a bit and bitmap record types, um, control record types, and so on. For the full details about EMF and EMR structures, you can find the well-documented materials on the uh, Microsoft website. Now let's dive into the issues about the VMware Virtual Printer in these years. VMware Virtual Printer has been regarded as one of the most important attack surfaces in VMware for many years. Early in VMware Workstation 11.1, uh, Costa of Google security team has found a lot of vulnerabilities in tpview.dll. <clears throat> he has leveraged one stack overflow vulnerabilities in tpview.dll <clears throat> JPEG 2000 handling function to a full VMware escape exploit. His exploit code is also used by many other following researchers. In last year, Matthews Uchek first on the same module based on Costia's code and discovered three CVEs. CVE 2016, 70, 82, 83, and 84. <clears throat> Here we would like to thanks to Matthews Uchek's great work. VMware also released an adversary VMSA 2016-0014 uh, for, for these three CVEs. So this should already be patched on VMware Workstation version 12.5.0. Uh, 
<clears throat> Next, uh, we will show you the details of these three series and their patch codes for uh, case studies. The first one I want to show you is the CVE 2016-7082. It's a double free vulnerability in TPV.dl EMR uh, small text out W record handling function. In this function, after some record data passed, the function tried to text out the text um, in EMR small text out W record. As you could see in the IDA screenshot, at the end of this function, pointer V8 uh, <clears throat> will be free twice because the first free is in the else branch. The question is how could we bypass the if branch conditions? Matthias Uchak said, the pointer of A3 at 44 value is always be a non-zero value. So <clears throat> it's difficult to enter the else branch to get the double free triggered. Uh, after we did some reverse engineering on the memory, we finally got the achieve method uh, is as easily as you just need to add a registry key on the host machine. The registry key you, you need to add is HK local machine software theme print TPV. And under this key, uh, you also need to add a D1 named uh, clip rect and set its value at zero. Then the pointer of uh, A3 at 44 value will be zero. Then the if condition will be bypassed and the double free vulnerability will be triggered. In this wind debug screenshot, you could see the EDI register is the pointer which would, would be free twice. Before we um, called the second free call, the pointer pointed heap buffer was already be freed. Then we invoke, uh, invoked uh, the second free call and we got the heap error detected. Uh, now we would like, uh, <clears throat> as we saw in the previous slide, VMware released an um, advisory VMSA 2016-0014 to fix this CVE. Issue has already been patched. However, the truth is VMware didn't patch it. The, the picture I show you is a deep patch of the C issue function between the VMware workstation version 12.1.1 and version 12.5.0. You could see there is no any difference between the two versions. Even in the latest version, VMware 14, and the vulnerability still exists. Now we would like to show you a demo about this issue on the latest ver VMware version 14. Please. Mm. Mm, because we can't, we can't disclose many details, uh, so uh, we just uh, show a proof of concept uh, of this issue in the latest version of VMware. You, you could see the version is the latest version 14, VMware 14.0.0. Uh, when I run the POC code, you could see the vprint proxy.exe on the host has been crushed. Uh, we've already reported this issue to to VMware security team, and we think uh, they have already had some solution on this. Uh, the second CVE, the CVE 2016 7083, is a memory corruption vulnerability in TPVU.dl while handling a malformed true type font file embedded EMF spoon file. In this case, in the EMF spoon file, after EMF content, we need to add another structure named the EMRI engine font structure. It contains the malformed true type font file. TPVU.dl will pass the true type font file content get a name table in it, uh, extract uh, the name buffer and name size structure, then call a mem size function to fill the name buffer with name size length zero. This issue is, uh, is before the mem size call, there is no any security check to restrict the name size. And the name size is in our crafted true type font file. It is controlled by us. So if uh, the name size is malformed as a very large number. The process will overwrite the memory with zero far beyond the name buffer to be an out of bounds write. Uh, 
issue. Now look at the IDA screenshot variable v7 is a name size what we could control. Before the main mem side call, there is no any v7 check to ensure its value. In the wind debug picture, the EDI register is the name size. It is set as a very large number, hex 8F. And then after we call the mem set, it made the memory corruption. Uh, the patch code added some necessary checks before mem set call to mitigate the, the vulnerability. Uh, the last CVE I will show you is the CVE 2016-7084. It's a set of vulnerabilities um, when tpview.dl decompress the JPEG 2000 file. This CVE includes nearly 40 different crashes discovered by Matus Uchak. From the crashes to know the real reasons of every box, one should know uh, JPEG 2000 decompression algorithm very much. It's really not a small work for us. In our talk, I will explain one of them as a case study. It's an out-of-bounds write vulnerability. This out-of-bounds write uh, vulnerability is present in tpview.dl jp2 decompression image function. In this function, it will allocate many buffers to place every decompressed data and also do some data operations on them. Look at the picture. Uh, in this function, there is a while loop takes up the values in a heap buffer as some other data, then refuse them to itself. The loop will, uh, the loop will do the same operation uh, for the whole heap buffer. The en heap entry size is hex bo. The filling operation starts from the heap user offset eight. Uh, every value type is a word type. Because hex bo subtract the yeah, heap header and the uh, uh, offset eight equals to hex AO. Uh, it's definitely equals to hex 28 times the word length four. Um, <clears throat> so the loop times should be hex 28. In programming, we know the loop count variable starts from zero, so the variable should end with hex 27. Uh, the problem here is there is, uh, there is no check for the loop times. The while loop will only stop when the decompressed data uh, is consumed. So this issue gives us a chance to do an out of bounds write to the next heap entry. In this wind debug screenshot, the heap buffer uh, the heap buffer is hex 3a02 afo. Uh, the edi register is the value the function will add to the buffer value. And the edx register is the loop count, which is already be hex 29. Uh, actually, when it was hex 2.8, uh, it's already an out of bounds write. However, at that time, the EDI register is zero. So after the value added, there is no impact on the memory. But at this time, the EDI register is hex E. The target address is hex 3.8.0.2.B.9.4, which belongs to the next heap buffer header. So after we step over the instruction, the next key pantry header is corrupted. Uh, at last, uh, in the patch code, added some um, safe checks. The loop times could no longer larger than or equal to the proper value. Uh, as we saw above, VMware Virtual Printer is a uh, so important VMware attack surface. It is very worth to do more farsing work on this. And the EMF file is composed of many complex EMR, EMR structures, so it's truly an appropriate farsing target. Thanks to Costia's code, our farsing work is only to mutate the EMR structures and combine them to, uh, to be a crafted EMI file. Uh, then send the, the EMI file to virtual printer and wait for capturing a lucky crash. And finally, by this work, well, we've got a couple of interesting issues, and we've all already reported them to VMware security team. Okay, thanks, Yakun. So now we are going to talk about uh, the, the VMware Workstation graphics components uh, that are susceptible to guest to host escape attacks. So we have talked about VM tools before. Uh, if you install VM tools in the guest operating system, uh, so along with other component, it, it also installs a completely fake graphics card. So under device manager in any Windows host, you ca it can be seen as VMR SVG 3D device. 
the sp the special thing about this uh, this graphics card is there is no no hardware actually exists for this uh, for this device so this is a completely fake graphics card so when the guest has to perform some graphics related operations the guest has to communicate with this uh, fake device and to to be able to make this communication easier this fake device actually provide several memory ranges which can be used by the guest OS to communicate with the this virtual gpu so this is a very high level uh, overview of the uh, vmr sbga2 device as you can see the uh, the pci device can uh, communicate with the host with, uh, with, with in the three medium the first one is the io port the, this is a simple in and out instruction that uh, that is executed to send some stuff to the host and the next one is the 2d frame buffer 2d frame buffer is quite simple the pixels to be ren to be rendered has to be uh, has to be written in this uh, 2d frame buffer and it will be rendered accordingly and the last one is the fifo memory queue this is quite interesting and complex because to be able to interact with this FIFO memory queue, uh, the guest OS has to uh, write FIFO commands to this FIFO memory queue and wait for the GPU to process the command. Once the command is processed, the, uh, the, the GPU will actually uh, execute the commands asynchronously and get the result back. So the interesting thing about this uh, this uh, FIFO memory queue and uh, this uh, virtual GPU, the most of these components are actually implemented in VMR VMX.exe process, which you see in the host and including the two memory ranges we have talked about, 2D frame buffer and FIFO uh, memory. They are actually directly mapped to the VMR VMX process when, when, any, when, uh, when any VM is running. So here are some of the example of 2D commands and 3D commands uh, uh, for, uh, for very obvious reasons since uh, the 3D commands are used to do more complex graphic stuff. Uh, the the command, 3D command handlers are more complex than 2D commands. So now if we look at some of the history of the bugs in uh, this FIFO command handling, uh, we'll definitely uh, have to mention the bug that was uh, named as CloudBust. So this is a very popular bug. The, command hand, uh, the, the bug was actually present in the 2D command SVGA CMD red copy. And the command handler did not actually have any check to verify whether, whether the, 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 the rectangle that is given for copy, it is inside the frame buffer or not. So when the source rectangle is outside the frame buffer and the destination inside the frame buffer, we can actually uh, read arbitrary da data from the VMR being processed into the frame buffer. And we have to remember that the, frame, the guest frame buffer is actually accessible from the host. So once we have the required data inside the frame buffer, we can easily get the data inside the guest operating system. So in this way, we can steal arbitrary information from the from VMR being process. So when the destination is outside the frame buffer and and the, uh, the source is inside the frame buffer, what you can do, we can achieve an arbitrary overwrite as well. So the, the, the author has demonstrated uh, how he has achieved a full-fledged guest-to-host uh, guest uh, exploit using this, uh, abusing, this, uh, abusing this vulnerability. So we'll add, we have added that in the reference section. If you're interested in details, you can refer to those. So the bug we have just discussed was actually mainly in the, the FIFO command handler. But when we are analyzing VMR patches in the recent days, what we have noticed that there is a certain shift in the focus. And uh, the, what we have seen, researchers and vulnerability researchers have shifted their focus to more complex graphics, graphics components, for example, graphic shaders. So shaders under VMR are a huge attack surface because of their complexity. So shaders are actually everywhere. Uh, virtually every modern graphic simulation you see in your um, everyday life in some way powered by uh, codes that is written for the GPU. Uh, the starting from the realistic lighting effect in the cutting edge AAA games to the 2D post-processing effects. A shader can be considered as a program that, is, uh, that runs in the graphics pipeline and tells the computer how to render each pixel. So this is, this is mainly used for the shading, applying appropriate level of lights, uh, darkness, and color within an image. So this is the, the shader actually can be, in, in simple word, what we can say, shaders allow graphics developer to directly program the GPU. So this is how the shader input looks like, and after it is compiled and rendered, this is what we get. This is, as you can see, there are some lightning effect, shading effect. So there are there are two types of shaders: 2D shaders and 3D shaders. And there are two two popular graphics libraries available for 2D and 3D graphics rendering. They are OpenGL and Direct3D. Since in this talk we'll be mostly talking, about, we'll be focusing on Windows stuff. Whenever we refer to graphics API, we refer to Direct3D. So now let's talk about the life of a shader. How, uh, so as we already said, the shaders are usually written in HLSL, uh, the high-level shading language, which looks something like this. And 
in, in, in Direct 3D version 9, the shaders were actually allowed to be written in uh, intermediate assembly language, but from Direct 3D 10, uh, it is mandatory to write the shader in HLSL, which looks something like this. So once the shader is compiled using Direct 3D APIs, what we get is shader bytecode. And if you disassemble the shader bytecode using any shader uh, disassembler, what we find is intermediate assembly language. So this intermediate assembly language actually get passed to the GPU driver, and GPU driver will actually uh, convert them to the um, to the to its proprietary instruction, and the GPU will actually execute those instructions. And what we see, what we we see some uh, graphics effect in our screen. So, the, so now we are going to talk about what what if we render a shader inside a VMware workstation. So in the guest OS, when any application use shader, it uses some several user mode APIs to uh, to process the shader. The shader actually first get compiled, and what we get is shader bytecode. And once the shader is compiled, some VM, VMR specific libraries comes into picture, which actually packs the shader and the shader into SVG 3D command buffer. And the buffer get passed to the kernel mode component of the device, uh, in this case, which is virtual SVG device. And once this is passed, this this virtual uh, this this GPU will, uh, fake GPU will actually pass those uh, this 3D command buffer to the host for processing. So once we have received the raw shader bytecode inside this uh, in, in host operating system, the shader bytecode that we have received at the host, it doesn't necessarily have to be compatible with the host. So the VMR VMX process will have to um, uh, do some translation, parsing, and conversion to make the shader bytecode compatible with the host operating system. So once this conversion is done and translation is done, the, and the GPU rendered the process, we see some graphics, uh, graphics special effects in the screen. So we have talked about passing 3D command buffer along with shader bytecode from guest to host. Before now we are going to see how it is usually done in the guest end. It is done using a protocol that is called uh, SVGA 3D protocol. SVGA 3D protocol is designed to be uh, API vendor and API neutral, but for convenience uh, it has been designed to be compatible with direct 3D most of the places. So the first the shader bytecode can be uh, passed from guest to host uh, using a 3D command called SVGA 3D CMD shader define. The parameters to be sent along with this particular 3D commands are, uh, are defined in a structure which looks something like this, as you can see. So as you can see, the structure holds some characteristics about the shader, which is shader type, and it also holds the raw shader bytecode. So after that, the space for the particular 3D command needs to be, and, and its parameter needs to be reserved in the FIFO memory queue. So in this example, the function is, the name is SVGA 3D FIFO reserve. It reserves the space for this SVGA 3D FIFO, uh, FIFO command and arguments. This reservation has to be done by making use of a structure called SVGA 3D CMD header. This header actually looks something like this. And as you can see, this structure actually holds some, uh, holds some uh, characteristics about the 3D command that we are going to pass to the GPU for, to execute. After, after this, uh, this reservation is done, what we have to do, we have to simply commit those commands for GPU to be, to be processed and wait for the GPU to finish the, the execution. So, what we have seen so far, we have received the raw shader bytecode in the host operating system. Now, as we have already said, the shader, the shader, uh, the shader needs to be translated, and uh, it, the, the host process actually has to make it compatible with the, the host GPU. So, for that, actually, there are a lot of, kind of translation and parsing going on. And you have to remember that when, a, when we are actually parsing some untrusted data, there can be some serious issues. So, in the screenshot, what you see inside the VMR VMX, it translates each and every guest shader instruction to the host specific shader instruction. The screenshot here shows how to uh, how the shader opcodes, each opcodes of this uh, intermediate shader assembly get, uh, they get converted. So now we are going to take a quick look at some of the vulnerabilities that has been passed, uh, passed in uh, uh, VM, uh, this uh, VMR workstation uh, uh, shaders. So th these are the uh, these are some of the advisories that has fixed some shader related issues. Uh, we are going to discuss a couple of them. So this is this is one of the patch that we have noticed when uh, VMware 12.5.5 was uh, released. Uh, what you have seen that uh, that this this particular piece of code is actually, actually responsible for uh, uh, parsing the um, shader assembly instruction DCL indexable temp and. What we can see here, the argument two of this function was actually directly coming from uh, argument two was we are writing to the this is the heap buffer that was uh, that we are writing to and the argument three was directly coming from the guest operating system which is untrusted. So using this bug actually we can trigger an arbitrary overwrite. So this is the this is the live debugging screenshot. What you can see here, 
the destination is RCX, which is the destination heap buffer. It is pointing to heap. And this RD8 actually directly coming from the uh, host uh, guest, guest operating system. As you can see, it is set to 4242. So using this bug, actually, we can trigger an arbitrary overwrite, and we can write some data into that into this uh, heap buffer. Now we are, I'm going to show a quick demo. So this is a vulnerable version of VMR workstation. This is a POC that we have developed from the patch. So under Windows 10, uh, there is a process called searchui.exe, which actually uses shader to perform some uh, animation. The start, the animation that you see in the start menu, it is usually done using shader. So this process will see, it will load all, um, many of the Direct3D uh, DLS that are associated with Direct3D. As you can see, some of these DLLs are loaded inside searchui.exe process. Now we have a driver in this place. So before the SVGA, virtual SVGA, SVGA device pass the SVGA 3D command buffer to the host operating system, it simply intercepts the content and write our own shader bytecode, custom, by, uh, custom shader bytecode, uh, to be able to trigger the vulnerability. So now when we click on the start button, it should send some shader, uh, three SVGA 3D command buffer and along with some shader bytecode to the host operating system. Now when you click on it, as you can see the VMware workstation has been crashed. So this is not a zero day, this vulnerability has already been fixed by VMware. We just developed this uh, POC from the patch. So we have seen a lot of similar issues got patched into the shader parsing code. The, here is another uh, issue that has been fixed by VMware. As you can see here, uh, the the A2 was the uh, second argument of the function was directly coming from the guest uh, guest operating system, and it is actually untrusted. And um, and we are writing some uh, uh, writing some content to the certain offset, and we can actually achieve out of bound write using this. And what you can see here, VMware has added a tiny little fix for this, just to make sure that this uh, the argument that is coming from the guest operating system has uh, added some bound checking for that. And there is another issue that has been fixed in uh, um, Shader Model 4 DCL Intermediate Constant Buffer Parser. As you can see, there is a MemCP call, and this, uh, the, th the third argument, which is the size of the MemCPY, it was directly coming from the host uh, guest operating system. And since this is untrusted data, and we can trigger an out-of-bound uh, condition here using this MemCPY. And VMware has added a fix for this by adding a small check for this, just to make sure that it is not greater than uh, hex, 10, uh, hex 1000. And if it is more than 1000, it will actually take you to some error, and it will just handle the error. So the vulnerabilities we have dis uh, discussed so far were mostly in the shader model 4. But uh, since, as we have already said, that uh, VMware supports many other operating systems, and it, the VMware VMX will have other shader model parser code as well. So this is an interesting patch that we have noticed in VMware workstation. Uh, what you can see here, the second argument, uh, second argument was actually coming from the directly from the guest operating system, and uh, uh, and this is the untrusted. VMware actually added this tiny little fix uh, just to make sure that the untrusted data is uh, is uh, untrusted. They had added some sanity sanity check on the untrusted data that is coming from the guest operating system. This function actually handles the shader model op call instruction. Uh, as you can see, it was directly cross-referenced to that function. This is the actual shader model one parser code. Uh, depending on the different, different assembly instruction, it will redirect. So we have talked about uh, some of the, uh, the three attack surfaces uh, uh, that that is that we have seen attacked most by the vulnerability researcher to uh, perform guest to host escape attack. But what we what we know that VMR is a very complex piece of software, and there are other components as well. So we 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 predict that we we in future we may see some more bugs in the SVGA components as well, uh, because there are many other stuffs, uh, many other uh, this uh, shader assembly parser. Uh, so we may see some more bugs in SVGA2 implementation, and uh, Unity feature is one of the uh, one of the very complex uh, feature that VMR Workstation provides. So we may see some bugs in the Unity feature as well. 
since this is a quite complex and we, which, which bugs may allow uh, to perform guest to host escapes. And, and other than that, every emulated device that, is, that we see inside the guest operating system can be susceptible to guest to host escape attacks, including the network card, including the sound and everything. So we may see some attacks in the other virtual devices as well. So now this is a takeaways of our talk. Uh, uh, as, we, as with other softwares, when VM with the virtualization softwares were developed, uh, probably uh, this, uh, this guest to host escape attacks were not seen as a problem. But uh, guest to host escapes are real now. So probably it is the right time to make some uh, changes or security improvement in the core virtualization tools. So uh, we have to, while doing that, we have to keep in mind the attack surface, the overall virtualization security, and uh, definitely the guest to host escapes. So in terms of exploitation, what we have seen while reverse engineering VMware workstation, it, it lacks a couple of things. Like, for example, there is no CFG protection so far in the VMR VMX process. But, but we, are, we, are, we are hopeful that VMR will improve this uh, real soon. So uh, one more suggestion to the, uh, the virtualization software user would be uh, we, they should, what they should do, they should minimize the attack surface by, uh, by minimizing, the, uh, minimizing by, by detaching the unused or unim unimportant virtualized components from the virtual machines, which definitely makes the case to host escape uh, uh, more difficult for attackers. So these are some uh, recommended reads. Uh, that we'd recommend to read if you are interested more about uh, some of these issues. Most of this, uh, this uh, papers were not published, uh, but it got published in um, last one, two months, I guess. So this brings us to the end of our today's presentation. Uh, thank you guys for your valuable attention, and uh, we'd like to thank the entire IDT research team, and especially Bing Sun. Uh, now we are open to questions. And later also, you can, you can send questions to our email addresses. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Do you have any knowledge about to what extent these vulnerabilities, they also exist in VMware server? See, uh, our primary uh, focus was uh, mainly the VMware workstation. We haven't yet analyzed the VMware servers. Um, but uh, yeah, since this is a, this probably it shares some core functionalities, so some of the vulnerabilities uh, and maybe we can see in the servers as well. But uh, we are we are I have no idea because we we won't, our focus was only VMR workstation. So did I adequately answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Hello. Uh, hey. Very great presentation. Oh, thanks. Uh, I would like to to know. I have saw in in. On one of the slides that uh, mm, the code uh, for the graphical process I generated in the VM, can it be used to mm, to execute code on the on the host machine and to grab the data out of it? Uh, I didn't. Can you repeat once? I... Yeah. The graphical code is generated in the virtual machine itself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shader byte code you were saying, yeah, right? Shader, yeah. Shader. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Can it be used to to steal the data from the host machine? No, see, see, you are passing the untrusted data to the uh, host operating system, right? Yes. So it, there is no way you can steal data. You can arbitrary, you can fade arbitrary data to the guest OS, and you may corrupt some memory and do this. But there is no way you can steal data because it is a one way. You are sending those data from guest to host. Okay, I understand. But uh, you got does it, this, but, that, but that, if that, you that, if you trigger if you are able to trigger some memory corruption into that host process, right, by sending those untrusted data, then you can trigger some uh, you can steal some information from the process. But this is nothing to do with the shader bytecode. This is a normal exploitation that we have discussed here, right? The, okay. how, to, how to bypass the ASLR and all this. So uh, th there is nothing to do with the stealing information just uh, using the shader bytecode. OK, thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, what is your claim about the double free bug? Is it a DOS only, or is it more than that? Because the demo was only a crash. Uh, yeah, cool. The double free crash that you have shown. Yeah. Is it? Is it, I mean, did you get a chance to look into the exploitation? Mm, no clue. The double free bug. You are talking about the use after free in the RPC or the uh, no, the double free. Double free. Double okay. free. Yeah. The one. So what is the claim? Uh, are you claiming is it more than that, or is it just a DOS? 
so this did you get a chance to check whether it is exploitable or not no no this is the one in this no no that one Okay, this one. Not this one. You're talking about this one, right? Yeah. That's right. So, so the, what the, is the claim? Is it a DOS bug or is it a exploitable bug? So I think what we have done so far, we have triggered the just to trigger the vulnerable code, and it is a, just a DOS. But it is definitely exploitable. On Windows. On Windows, right? Yeah. Is it because they're using uh, their own management of HIP, or the VMware is using its own management, or is it a Windows management HIP? See, what I feel that uh, since it's a double free issue, right? We need to find a way to create a fake object, right? To be able to uh, to be able to uh, to be able to exploit this condition. So I think we haven't done any research on this fake yeah, yeah. object creation. So uh, if you if you have a way to create uh, a fake object uh, into that freed object inside the frame uh, freed object, we'll be able to probably gain code execution using that. No, the right. only way I'm asking is because hmm. double free mitigation on Windows was way past in Windows Server Spec 2. So to have a safe unlinking. Oh uh, yeah, so, but uh, yeah, actually, so the, the matter of the fact is we haven't really ch get a chance to uh, look into the exploitability of the bug. Okay. But uh, the VMR has fixed this issue already, so w we are not really quite sure about this. Okay, I think that's it then. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll encourage you to uh, the submit feedback. Probably you will get a feedback link in uh, with your on your registered email address. We'll we'll appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time.